In this video, I'm going to show you how to solve the Alex problem called using the combined gas law. The combined gas law is P1 V1 over N1 T1 equals P2 V2 over N2 T2. And this equation is one that we would use when we can't use one of the simpler gas laws like Boyle's law, Charles's law, or Avogadro's law. So this applies to a gas that has more than two variables changing at the same time. Let's take a look at the problem and see which variables have been provided to us. First, it tells us that we have um, a sample of gas, the temperature is being lowered from 14 degrees Celsius, so that's our initial temperature. And as you know, we need to have that in units of Kelvin, so I'm gonna do that conversion right now. 14 plus 273 is 287 Kelvin. The temperature is lowered from 14 to negative 14. So negative 14 is going to be our T2. 273 minus 14 is 259 Kelvin. Um, it says the pressure is changed. The initial pressure is 0.58 kilopascals. So that's our initial pressure. The volume increased by 50%. So this is going to be, this is going to be a little bit tricky. This is where we're going to get information about our V1 and also our V2. And what is our final pressure? That's what the problem is asking us to solve. So in this problem, we're not given any information about the number of moles of a gas. In that situation, it means that the number of moles of gas is not changing. When we're using the combined gas law, if we have any one of the four variables that is not undergoing any sort of change, uh, meaning that N1 is equal to N2 mathematically, we can just eliminate that variable completely because you know mathematically nothing is changing, so it's not doing anything. We don't need to know the number of moles of gas. All that we need to know is that they aren't changing. So I'm actually just gonna erase that completely. Okay, so we know our T1 and we know our T2. We know our P1, we're being asked to solve for P2. The last trick that we have here is to figure out what to fill in for these volume numbers, the initial volume and the final volume. Um, because it doesn't give us an actual number, it just tells us that the volume is increasing by 50%. So we've got two options that we can use here to figure out what V1 and V2 is. And for most students, the easiest option is just going to use some, going to be to use some sort of hypothetical volume number, just kind of some random number. So let's say that our initial volume is one liter. And then um, using the information that's given to us, we're going to create or figure out what the net new volume will be. If the volume increases by 50%, that means that the new volume is 1.5 liters. Now you might be saying, how on earth can we do this? How can we just make up random numbers in this problem? Um, be the reason that we're allowed to do that is because all that matters here is the mathematical relationship between V1 and V2. It doesn't matter what the actual numbers are. It just, all that matters is that we know the relationship in terms of how they're changing. So we could literally use any kind of set of numbers for V1 and V2, as long as we are being um, consistent with this increase by 50%. So maybe we wanted to say that V1 was two liters, in which case we would say that V2 would be three liters. Um, and you know, you're gonna be able to see that whatever we use here, the mathematical relationship is going to be exactly the same between these two numbers. That's really all that matters. Another thing that you might um, see done in a problem like this is just to say that we don't know what V1 is, we're gonna call it V1, and if V1 is called V1, then V2 is 1.5 times V1. So this would be another option. But for most students, this last thing that I wrote here is usually pretty confusing, and it's just easier to just throw some hypothetical numbers in there. Um, so I'm gonna stick with the one and the 1.5 for this particular problem, and then we are going to just go ahead and start plugging these numbers in. P1 is 0.58 kilopascal. If we take a peek at the units um, that we're supposed to be reporting our pressure in, we can see that the units are in kilopascals. So that's how I know I don't wanna change this into atmospheres. V1, we're gonna call one liter. T1 is 287 Kelvin. So those are all our initial variables. P2, that's the number that we're trying to figure out. So that's still an unknown. V2 is 1.5 liters, and T2 is 259 Kelvin. And so now we just have to do a lot of math on this problem. I'm gonna go ahead and work out the left side first. 
0.58 times 1 divided by 287 is 0 0.00202. And my units here are kilopascals times liters divided by Kelvin. And that is going to be equal to P2. And my right side is 1.5 divided by 259. 0 0.00579, and my units here are liters over Kelvin. So I'm going to divide both sides by this 0 0.00579 liters over Kelvin so that I can cancel that out and solve for P2. I definitely don't recommend doing this in a couple of steps for Alex because Alex is really a stickler about sig figs uh, and rounding and things like that. So you probably want to just shove all of this into your calculator all at once. 0 0.00202 divided by 0 0.00579. Um, this gives me a P2 of 0.34. We wants it to two significant figures, so 0 0.35. And let's take a look at our units. The liters cancel, the Kelvins cancel. We end with units of kilopascals, 0.35. And again, like I said, I would suggest doing all of the math here all in one step, not stopping and rounding in those intermediate calculations because that could cause this answer to be a little bit off.